2023 was dubbed the year of recession that never happened. But what if the recession just didn't happen yet? 2024 has been surrounded with a lot of positivity, both regarding the economy and also the stock market. But often they say recession happens when you least expect it. But when did we last have a recession similar to the one that we could see in the next couple years? Well, we have to go back to the period of 2006 all the way through to 2009. And that's when we saw the GFC or the Great Financial Crisis. It was a crisis brought about by exuberant housing prices in the US that created a bubble that investment banks started to speculate in. They lost a bunch of money, had to go bankrupt, and that eventually slowed down the entire construction sector surrounded around real estate. And there were many indicators that were flashing red, saying there was a storm on the horizon in 2006 that eventually came true in 2008. All of that culminated in the central bank in the United States pausing interest rates in 2006, and then they started to cut them in 2007. And it was a whole year after that when we started to see the recession take place. And now I wanna wind us forward to today, where we've been paused in terms of interest rates since really September of 2020. The usual time span of pausing interest rates before cutting them sits at around nine months. That puts us on track for interest rate cuts to happen at around April of this year. And you might have heard that as positive news in a lot of finance, economic media, mainstream media. But what they often don't say is that recession usually follows around six months later. And that really puts us on a timeline of recession all the way from really second half of 2024 through to the first half of 2025. And what we need to remember are these fundamental economic principles that drive all of our markets, all of these different cycles we see take a long time. And in the age of Instagram, TikTok, where we're getting distracted all the time by cat videos that we're sending to our partners or new cooking tips to teach us how to make homemade bread from scratch. We're getting distracted all the time when these processes can take many years to play out. And all of that begs the question, what does the fundamental data suggest today about issues that are coming down the pipeline? The first data piece I want to look at is a bit separate from everything else is the retail sales growth as a year over year change. That's the blue line on the chart. The red line is the year over year change of inflation or the increase often in the price of goods and services. So whenever retail sales are growing faster than inflation, that's really telling us that people are buying a higher volume of goods and services. Whereas whenever the blue line is beneath the red, that means that retail sales are not keeping up with inflation. People are actually buying less things. And we're still underneath that point today. We're still seeing a reduction in the amount of goods actually being purchased by the time you take into account price increases. And this might show up as a positive when you have a look at company earnings because I've seen this over and over again. They're manufacturing less products over time, which costs the company less, but they're just jacking up the prices. So overall, companies are still making decent profits, but but in terms of the underlying health of the consumer, people like you and me, it's showing a deteriorating picture. And to help get a better diagnosis of the consumer in the US, it's all really about jobs data. Let's just start off with the unemployment rate. This is just the broad measurement of the employment conditions in the United States. We've been really stagnant, not moving from 3.7% unemployment. That's seen often as a positive thing. And we've been in that environment for around 18 months. But when we start to go into specific sectors, having a look at that jobs data, we start to see some different stories. Let's have a look next at manufacturing job growth percent as a year over year change. We've just crossed over negative territory. So we're starting to see less manufacturing jobs in the US than we did a year ago. But that in itself is not a strong indicator of a weak economic time period. Manufacturing in the United States has really been weak really ever since about the 90s or even going back towards the 70s. I've grabbed a chart from Macroeconomic Cycles Research. They've got here educational and health jobs growth as a year over year change. And they've pried that away from the rest of the employment growth. And with this cyclical job growth less than 1% today, the only other really time points where we see worse growth than this or even contraction are during recession. So I can highlight the 90s, the 1991 recession, the dot-com bubble bust, and also the 
2008 GFC. And also in this report, we have the average weekly hours charted here for you to see going all the way back to the 90s. And we've moved down from about 34.5 average hours worked by employees in the US. And that's moved down to 33.7 hours worked on average per week. That's a 3% reduction in the total hours worked. And you can think of that as the different job environment we've been in since the pandemic. A lot of companies don't want to lose good workers and they've kind of held on to them. That's why the unemployment rate has been highly stable, except these companies need to cut back in some regard. We have had a weaker economy really since 2022. It's picked up again in 2023 a little bit, but overall these corporations have had to make cutbacks somewhere. So whether or not you cut everyone's hours by 3%, that's one option, or you actually give everyone the same amount of hours, but actually just cut 3% of your employees, that's effectively the same outcome. So when I flash up this unemployment rate again, think of this as having a 3% unemployment rate added on top of where we are at about 3.7%. So if you take that just at face value, that likely puts us at around 6.5% unemployment. Or if you take a more conservative look at things, yes, we might cut hours, but that usually happens during recession anyway. Maybe the unemployment rate should be as high as 4.5% today rather than where we are. And I'm even gonna split it apart even more and focus just on construction. Here I have a chart of the year over year change in construction spending. And you might not be overly surprised. Yes, we had a weak period going into 2020, but we actually maintained a decent amount of construction spending throughout that time point. 2021, we were in a bit of a bubble in terms of real estate and also manufacturing goods for people to purchase while they were at home. And then we saw a hit to the economy with high inflation in 2022. People bought bought less things. What did surprise economists, however, was the pickup we've had throughout 2023 in construction spending. We went down to a growth rate of about 2% as a minimum in October of 2022. That's picked up to over 11% to today's numbers. And this is where I introduced the idea of kryptonite to recession, and that is government spending. What we can point out are laws and spending bills that have already been put in place and are 100% guaranteed to come through the pond pipeline in the next five to 10 years. Straight from the Democrats website, we have here that the Inflation Reduction Act is expected to save the government 300 billion US dollars. We have roughly 433 billion US dollars in government funding towards renewable energy and healthcare. Most of this going towards infrastructure. And this has already attracted $500 billion worth of investment from corporations themselves. So this might be some sort of price matching system. So if a corporation spends $20 billion in building out some solar panels, maybe the government's willing to spend 15 billion or 10 billion in order to help them do that. And this is expected to attract total investment of over a trillion US dollars. A lot of that happening in the next five years. So that's a decent chunk of investment, but that's not even taking into account the CHIPS Act yet. CHIPS Act is funding targeting the onshoring of semiconductor manufacturing. Now, a real simple layman's way of understanding these computer chips is effectively a light on and a light off, ones and zeros, that's how computer code works. And when we can manufacture computer chips at a smaller and smaller scale, effectively that just means you can put more of these ones and zeros on a single chip and you can increase the amount of calculations you can do. And one example of why it's so important to have these really efficient smart chips was back in the Ukraine-Russia conflict in 2022. Apparently Russia used up a bunch of its semiconductor chips early in the war and didn't have a way of getting them in the country just yet. According to reports, they used up all of their highly accurate targeting long distance missiles and therefore they had to shift back towards Soviet era type tactics where they just picked a target within a kilometer radius and then just dropped missiles. The Biden administration has pledged 52.7 billion US dollars to help create these manufacturing facilities onshore in the US. A lot of this funding seems to have gone towards Micron and Qualcomm. They are some of the biggest manufacturers of semiconductors in the US, where these two companies have already personally pledged 40 billion US dollars and 4.2 billion dollars in these new age manufacturing facilities called FOBs. According to reports from the Department of Commerce, they haven't handed over any money yet because they're not sure these companies are going to spend it wisely and efficiently. And part 
of me is actually positively surprised that the government is being highly stringent in where this money is going, very different to maybe the recent past. But overall, in terms of the economy, I see this as a positive catalyst that hasn't happened yet. So this could be another source of funds that help keep the US out of recession. And when we compare that over a trillion US dollars being spent on infrastructure against the roughly half a trillion US dollars that was spent to stimulate the economy, get us out of the GFC, you can see why recession has been held off. But comment down below if you think that the spending is not going to come quick enough to actually save the economy. And if you did like today's video, then why not hit the like button? Also subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content like this. I want to thank my YouTube member, Brutalist Empire. This is priced at one US dollar a month, and it's just a way for you to give back to the channel and keep this channel going for the long term. All right, thanks for your time today, guys. See you next time. Bye.